Hi, and welcome to Tea and Strumpets, a Regency Romance Review. I'm Zoe. And I'm Kelsey. And today we're back with a book review, which I was really happy to get back into reading. Um, I know we did, you know, some last month, but now it feels like we're rolling back in the books. Yeah, we are. And I thoroughly enjoyed reading this one. Spoilers. Spoilers. Sorry, (laughs) I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was a reread and we talked about it last week. Today we are reading It Started with a Scandal by Julie Ann Long which is the second to last book in the Penny Royal Green series. The penultimate Penny Royal Green book. (laughs) Exactly. And we talked about how we don't remember it much, but then again, we read it and we were just like, why is it not lying in Olivia's book? We need the last one. But it was a good reread, just going to say. Yeah. (laughs) I'm excited to talk about it, too. And we have a couple little author facts. Um, Just a reminder, because this is such a good reminder, that Julianne Long has not one, but two new books out this year for her Palace of Rogue series. I believe she has one coming out in April and one later in the year in yes, the like November, December time. It's, well, it's going to come out before Christmas because it's a Christmas one. Ooh, mm-hmm. fun. I saw the cover actually, and she's in this like luscious green dress with trimmed with white fur, and mm-hmm. I felt very seasonal. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And then also some bookstagrammers and they're doing a Penny Royal Green read along. Yeah. These awesome, actually some listeners from our show too are hosting it and they have been reaching out to Julianne Long and she has been sending them like little goodies to send out and answering questions. And it's so awesome. Yeah. So if you want to go ahead and check that out, you can... Go to her Instagram or her website because she is promoing it there. And if you want to find out more about that read along, I, I'm sorry if I don't remember all of the people that are running it, but two that I know are our listener, Natalie, um, who's at Kiss and Let Me Tell You. And also, um, I believe her name is Sarah, and she's at Romantically Swept Away. And those there's some underscores in there. Um, but if you search it, I'm sure you'll find them. And they're doing a really brilliant job. I joined the Read Along Discord, and my goodness, they've got like giveaways and photo challenges and Zooms that people can participate in. And so if you're listening to this, why not join that as well? Absolutely. All right. So transitioning here, we're going to talk a little bit about a history fact. So I have a little BBC magazine article tagged in there, which I just thought was very interesting. Um, I'm not going to read it here, um, but I'm going to, we're going to put it in the show notes. And it's basically talking about French nobility that still exists today. And Ooh. like, but it talks about like how their family has survived and how they still are French nobility, despite the fact that, you know, that's not really very French anymore since they are a republic and have voting and a president, but there still is remnants of French nobility today. And one of our main characters in our book is a French noble who escaped um, death <laughs> and uh, made his way around basically the world. So... Yes. And so our history fact today is all about how he could have survived and what did nobles do if they somehow managed to survive the reign of terror. So the reign of terror resulted in an estimated 40,000 executions, primarily landed nobility, courtiers, and clergy. Many upper-class French emigrated to other countries. A typical example is that of Pierre Dupont, founder of the chemical company E.I. Dupont de Nemours and Company. I hope I said that right. I'm not French. (laughs) Being a member of the lesser nobility, the revolution never got around to executing him, so he survived. After 1794, the execution stopped, but the persecution continued. The economy was bad, and the socialist elements that controlled the government made life difficult for ex-nobles. DuPont tried becoming a printer, but it was hard to make money, so he left for America with his family. Other nobles just made do as best they could, working educated jobs. Many became lawyers, doctors, or accountants. Large estates were broken up, but many nobles who survived still possessed smaller property or buildings and were able to retain and operate them after the Thermidorian reaction, essentially becoming 
landlords. Some survivor types acted like nothing ever happened. They just changed their spots to whatever was needed and stayed as rich as ever, serving the powers that be. So that's really a good commentary on our main character because his family, he had his properties either seized or broken up and he ended up becoming first mate on the ship with Captain Ardme or Earl of Ardme. Flint. Asher Flint. Captain Flint. Flint. Yes. yes. So he was the Captain first mate Flint. of Asher Flint, which is how we know Love. Sorry, that's one of our that's our main character. Anyway, but in the book, he kind of is recounting his struggles as a lesser French noble, yet trying to reclaim some of what was lost. Mm-hmm. And we, of course, have tropes, as we always do. Uh, Our main tropes today are class differences. We also have money problems and, you know, using marriage to solve those problems. Uh, We've got a child out of wedlock. And finally, we have the employer slash employee dynamic. Mm -hmm. And our main characters today are Lord Philippe LeVay and Miss Elise Fountain. So, shall we get into it? We shall. Elise Fountain is interviewing for the position of housekeeper on account of the fact that she has been let go from Miss Endicott's school for girls. She had been a teacher there, but due to being unable to hold her tongue, she'd been let go and luckily had been able to get a reference from the Redmond family. Part of the reason for being so desperate for a job is because she has to care for her six-year-old son, Jack. It's beneficial that housekeepers are referred to as Mrs., and therefore they will assume her son's father is dead, instead of just absent. The household is currently let by Lord LeVay, who is recovering from an attack. He has also gone through three housekeepers in quick succession due to his temperament. The meeting that they had was brief. LeVay was direct and to the point, and Elise quickly realizes that if he did not look so haggard from recovery, he'd probably be truly devastatingly handsome. Elise impresses enough, though, and is hired on trial for two weeks. LeVay, however, does not have faith Elise will make it the two weeks. She seemed too young and optimistic to gain loyalty from the current, quote, lazy recalcitrant staff. The next day, though, after getting Jack settled in his room and set off to the vicarage for his lessons, Elise goes to find out what is up with that lazy recalcitrant staff. She finds them playing five-card loo in a kitchen that has clearly not been scrubbed in a long time. Quote, Ah, if you're like the furniture, that must mean that you haven't been cleaned adequately in some weeks. Elise said this brightly, or perhaps you're all dim like the hallways, a bit greasy like the hearth here in the kitchen. All the staff is now staring at her outright, unsure of how to proceed with this new housekeeper. They do get around to introducing themselves. There are the maids, Kitty and Mary, the footman, Ramsay and James, and lastly, Dolly, the washerwoman and cook. The last is most, is the most, The last is the most intimidating and clearly the one leading the group. The others quickly show Elise signs that they can be molded. Dolly, on the other hand, is tall, broad, and does not hold back her disdain for Elise. Elise's first battle of wills is cut short when the bell that summons her rings. She takes her time, though, to instruct the servants on what she expects to happen in her absence. And with the vehement ringing of the bell for a second time, Elise leaves them to their tasks. LeVay has summoned her to give her the household budget. What she does within that budget is up to her, including if she feels the need to add or remove staff. Elise asks him if there is anything she can do to make it feel more like home. He dismisses the notion in hand, telling her about his estates that were seized in the revolution. He informs her that her job is that of first mate, responsible for the stores and the morale and health of the crew. Over the next few days... Elise goes about making improvements to the house, which LeVay promptly notices. She has his study cleaned and even puts flowers, lavender, and hyacinth in the study, winning a point in her favor as LeVay then concedes to alter his staunch and stark budget to include a shilling for flowers. Through their encounters, LeVay and Elise get to know one another. He admires her moxie and the fact that she is succeeding where others have obviously failed. She's even winning him over in other ways, providing him with willow bark tea to ease the pain in his hand that was injured in his attack. 
To thank her for the tea, he gives her a brown leather chair that he had taken from France. He had noticed how she admired it at their first meeting and all of the subsequent meetings thereafter. As LaVey accepts her help in pain management, he also accepts her help with other ways, such as penning letters to his remaining family in France, his grandfather and sister. When writing these letters, Elise finds that she is... Um, when writing these letters, Elise learns a lot more about his character. Reading a letter from his sister, quote, What is that word, Mrs. Fountain? It appears to have been blurred by bitter tears. Cold-hearted, I believe, she said. And that one? Indifference. Ah, I thought so. And so we go on. If you would be so kind as to tell me whether the roof is leaking, whether the livestock lives, whether your horse is starving, whether there is enough food on the table, and whether the servants have defected or remain, my cold, indifferent heart should be gladdened. With love, your brother. Elise stopped writing and tilted her head, imagining the beautiful Marie Helene, beautiful and spoiled and frantic, who would read this letter and stomp her foot, and perhaps completely miss the fact that the entire letter was a sardonic masterpiece. Once Elise leaves and LaVey is reviewing the letter she has written out, he notices a tear on one, right on the letter home. Later that evening, he asks her about her home and learns that she is also unable to return, though will not divulge the reason why. This story helps build LaVey's feelings towards Elise as he realizes she may actually understand how he feels about living in England. Below stairs, clever Elise is winning favor with the suspicious staff. She promises the footmen they'll be receiving livery, which has them taking more pride in their position, even acting as valet to LaVey. The maids have been lured by the prospect of LaVey throwing a party where they may impress ladies attending and potentially be hired elsewhere as ladies' maids. And as the house improved, so does the draw between Elise and LaVey. It turns out that they have similar senses of humor and double entendre. However, one day, LaVey takes their flirting a touch too far and then claims it is just because he is French. But Elise also reminds him of their different of the differences in their stations and thoroughly chastised, he apologizes. The only thorn in her side is Dolly. The washerwoman has taken to being too sweet to Elise, and one day she's so sweet, she's treacle sweet. That day, she also finds it strange that Dolly would like to take her half day in an open cart with her sister when it's pouring rain outside. As Elise heads to start in on polishing the silver, she notices that the porcelain cabinet is ajar, and getting a gut feeling, she opens the door to find a blue sauce boat missing, one of the few pieces LaVey took from his home in France. She knows immediately what has happened and confronts Dolly. Dolly tries to intimidate Elise by her sheer size, but little did she know Elise is a little honey badger. It is a thing of beauty. Petite Elise stands her ground, gets the sauce boat back, and firmly sends Dolly packing. LaVey just so happens to witness the entire thing and tells Elise that the housekeeper position is officially hers. On his way out in amazement of Elise's staunch defense, LaVey finds himself face to face with a small boy he's never seen before. Jack and LaVey finally meet, and LaVey learns that Elise is a mother. That evening, he calls Elise to his study again and professes his admiration for how she handed Dolly, and also to compliment her son, quote, "'His manners are lovely, even if he is a bit loquacious,' he teased gently. "'A clever child, clearly. Takes after his mother.'" He then proceeds to offer for Jack to come visit him, as he can share with him stories from his travels and such. And then he proceeds to discuss the party he would like to host. Nothing so grand as a ball, but a smaller gathering with dancing involved. And would Elise mind if he practices his waltz with her? He has had little chance to do so since he was attacked. As we all know, dancing in the study ends in a kiss. This is no exception to the rule. (laughs) Philippe. He didn't know if it was a protest or a plea. She'd said his name. His name. And now he knew she thought of him that way, possibly alone in the dark at the top of the stairs. He pulled her into his body, and then his hand slid down her arm and glided as naturally as a river glides right to the sea, to the small of her back, where it fit as if she'd been carved by the creator expressly for him. And her face was lifting up as his came down. Had he ever kissed anyone before? He shuddered from the pleasure of it, from the glorious spike of newness that drove right down through his very being, the soft give of her mouth, tentative at first, but not reluctant, finding the fit with his. Despite the kiss, Elise tells LaVey that nothing more can happen further. 
So the day of the party arrives, and Levey is supposed to be showing his favor to Lady Alexandra Prudeau, the woman he's hoping to marry, as her family fortune can help buy back his former house in Provence. However, he stalls by taking Olivia Eversee out to dance. He is curious if she still loves Lion Redmond. After all, she is now engaged to another, but when they dance, she does not look for her fiancé, yet her fiancé cannot take his eyes from her. He does learn that the date of Olivia's wedding is the second Saturday in May. LeVay does his duty, though, and takes Alexandra out for a stroll. She is all willing to tell him the scandalous past of his housekeeper. It seems the words Elise had spoken that got her fired were directed at Alexandra, and the vain girl is not done slandering Elise's good name. She tells LeVay all about the fact that Elise's son was born out of wedlock and that she had gone after a man above her station and he had left her before the baby was born. And how dare the school think that they could simply go on as normal with Elise being a teacher, despite the fact that she had a child out of wedlock. So Elise had basically gone after her and forced the school's hand in firing her. Elise is congratulating her staff on a job well done when her bell rings. She goes to see what LeFay needs, and he asks her about Jack's father. What he really wants to know is, did Elise love him and wish he was still part of her life? He tells her how confused he is by the whole situation because he cannot understand how anyone would willingly leave her. Quote, there is no shame in passion, Elise. The shame is in abandoning you with the consequences. His voice still had that husky edge. The shame is all his. Those words combined with other remarkable affirmational phrases, Elise steps over the housekeeper lord boundary line and we have encounter number one, where Elise gets a fabulous orgasm, but they do not have intercourse. Not yet, anyway. Our second encounter comes after LeVay goes to the pub and sees Seamus Duggan, who's got his eyes all for Elise. When Elise returns home, LeVay asks her about her feelings for Mr. Duggan. She tells him that Seamus is very nice, but she is not in love with him. And the tension builds and the conversation ends with another orgasm for Elise. Leaving the encounter, LeVay is a bit shaken, but also writes a note to Elise's parents, whom he now knows disowned her. He ends the letter with, I have sailed the oceans and fought wars and won and lost fortunes. I still know only two things for certain. Life is short. Love matters most. For Christmas, LeVay leaves gifts for Elise and Jack. He gives to her the hairbrush from her mother, which is one of the few possessions she took when she left home, that she had sold to get stockings for the footmen, and a letter from her parents. The letter tells her that they missed her and regretted her, their actions when they had heard the news of Jack. She and Jack are welcome home anytime. LeVay is having dinner with Alexandra and her family on Boxing Day when Ramsey, one of his footmen, arrives at the house telling him that Jack has gone missing and no one can find him. LeVay, knowing he is turning his back on a chance for marriage, leaves the dinner in search of Jack. He finds him in the parish bell tower. It turns out Alexandra's younger sister has told Jack that he is a bastard. Quote, I don't have a father, Jack said miserably, his voice a hush as if he were confessing a shameful secret. Almost everyone else does. I think I'm supposed to. And then Philippe could almost literally feel his heart breaking, cracking like the surface of an ice pond. I don't have a father either, Jack. Did your father go away too? Jack sounded sympathetic, in a manner of speaking. Are you a bastard too? Some might say, Jack. Some might say. But here's the most important part about not having a father, and I want you to listen closely because I'm a clever man and I speak only truth. Do you believe me? Jack nodded. When you don't have a father, you must learn to be stronger and braver and more resourceful, which is a word that means you will always know best how to take care of yourself and the people you love. And sometimes it's a bit lonely to not have a father, but when you have a big heart, and you do, you will never be lonely for long. LeVay takes Jack home to a frantic Elise, and after Jack goes to sleep, Elise goes to LeVay's room and confesses how she had known this day would come, but it didn't make it any easier. Quote, you cannot protect him from the world, but you can teach him how to move in it. You can teach him that he can still be kind when other people are not. And who knows that better than you? From there, we have what you can expect after hearing a charming, handsome man say the most perfect things to you. Encounters three, four, and five in quick succession. 
Life continues, and LaVey needs to go to London to see Alexandra. Elise believes it is to formalize their marriage. She knows what it means to him to be able to buy back his childhood home. Little does she know that LaVey is there to break ties with Alexandra and her family. So, knowing that she cannot risk seeing LaVey again, especially if he's engaged to be married, she takes Jack to her parents' house in Northumberland. LaVey is shocked to find Elise gone when he returns, and would have set off immediately in pursuit, but he is stopped by a visitor. His sister has come all the way from France. Elise had added a postscript in one of LaVey's letters telling Marie Helene about his injuries and recovery. Marie Helene had gotten on the first boat to England when she got the news. She'd rather be with him in England than in France, where everything is no longer the same. A month goes by for Elise when suddenly LaVey appears. And of course, he is here to profess his love. Quote, I am here because there is life and there is death. But they are one and the same without you, Elise. I thought I needed everything I once had. I thought I owed it to my family to preserve it as it once was. But the only thing that gave those places meaning was love. My family has scattered or died, gone on to make new lives elsewhere. All the memories I wished to keep were comprised of love. And home, Elise, is anywhere love is. He stepped toward her urgently and looked down. And you are my love. <sighs> Elise shares her own love for him, and the two are married in short order in Penny Royal Green. But LaVey has one last thing to do. He needed to repay his debt to the man who had saved his life when he was attacked. And that man is known by a few names. He's known as Mr. Hardesy. He's also known as Lichette. And of course, Lion Redman. So we cut to the ship where Lion Redmond receives a note, and it says, quote, She's getting married on the second Saturday in May. Ooh, ba -ba -ba. <laughs> goosebumps. All right. Well, let's get talking about this book. But first, shall we adjourn to the parlor? We shall. Today, we'd like to share with you a new upcoming title from Ella Quinn, the most eligible Viscount in London. In the second installment of her new trilogy, a dashing suitor must decide if love and marriage are mutually exclusive. So the synopsis is, Viscount Gavin Turley is convinced that love matches cause nothing but trouble. Still, after months of courting, he's fallen for Miss Georgie Featherton. He's passionate about her, in fact. But words of love are not an indulgence he will allow himself. When he presents Georgie with his marriage proposal, he will lead with his head, not his heart. His qualifications as a husband are excellent, after all. What could go wrong? No sooner does Gavin kneel on one knee than Georgie's heart goes a flutter with joy. Finally, the proposal she longed for had arrived, yet Gavin seemed to be listing his credentials for a business partnership, not a romantic union. Without a declaration of love, Georgie can only reject his offer, unless the ladies of the ton and Georgie's grandmama have anything to do with it. For sometimes it takes a wiser eye to see that love behind a guarded heart and a clever scheme to bring it out of hiding. Oh, I love like the dragons of the ton slash grandmothers that are like. I are love the... when a grandma gets involved. Let's be real. Right? Every time a grandma gets involved, it's always like pristine. It's like, I mean, I mean, the the ultimate right is Lady Danbury. Like yes. any Lady Danbury type is like just so fabulous. I just keep thinking about Hyacinth's book when she and Lady Danbury are like, you know, going back and forth, reading a novel. And I can just imagine this grandmother of Georgie's in this book, like just getting into it and just being yeah. like, you guys are in love. Or even like, there's a lot of Bridger. We've been doing a lot of Bridgerton, so Bridgerton's on my mind. But, but even like, just like, love will grow. You don't need him to say he loves you. He's super eligible. <laughs> so if that sounds like a fun read to you too, you can order it right now. Because it came out on March 30th, so it's at your fingertips. Although, you know what? It is the second book in the series, so maybe before you click order, you might want to order the first book in the series first. Yeah, if you haven't read it, you can definitely get caught up, and now you have two excellent books to get started with. 
And if you'd like to find us on social media, as always, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at T as in Tom and as in Nancy Strumpets, Facebook slash T and Strumpets, and YouTube by searching our name. And if you're listening to us on YouTube, now is a great time to click that thumbs up and hit the subscribe before you forget. Liking and commenting on our videos and subscribing to our channel is a really wonderful way to let us know that you like what we're doing. And if you'd like to know ahead of time what we're going to be reading each month, you can subscribe to our email notifications via our website. And if you subscribe, you're going to be the first to know what we're reading. Plus, you get all sorts of extras, which include exclusive content from each of the authors who join us on the podcast. And our website is romancepod.com. And there you can find episodes, more information about us and other resources. So take a look. We also would like you to know that we post links to all the books we talk about in each episode in the show notes of our podcast and on our blog. If you purchase a book through those links, we get a small portion of that sale. So that's another way to help support us. But if you're buying your book through an indie bookstore instead, then we in turn are proud to be supporting that sale. We need to save those indie bookstores. (laughs) Yay. And since we're talking about liking what you're hearing and supporting If that's you, we would be honored if you would leave us a review. Reviews on Apple Podcasts, Facebook, or anywhere else you can review us really help other listeners find the podcast. And we talk about this every episode um, because I, for one, know like even podcast I love, getting around to leaving a review is something that slips my mind. (laughs) So that's why we always say it. But we are at 88 ratings in the US on Apple Podcasts and 99 worldwide on Apple Podcasts. And we would just love it if we can push that number over 100. And so all you have to do is click five stars. And if you're in the mood to leave us a review, we would love that, of course. And we just want to thank you in advance for all your support. All right, Zoe, let's talk about it started with a scandal. Let's do it. As expected, I think you and I both said in the last episode, like, we bet we're going to like this book more than we remembered. And I definitely did. This was a really sweet book. I absolutely loved it. I think I picked it up in the evening and I was like, I'll just get started with it. And of course, like stayed up way too late reading it. And I'm not going to lie. There were moments of such tenderness and like sweetness. I was teary eyed. Like I don't get teary eyed reading a book very often, but there were some moments in this book where I was just like, oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, as always with the Julianne Long book, I maybe it, it sounds like maybe I didn't love it quite as much as you loved it, but I really liked this book, I want to say, up front. But like, even in the moments where I was feeling like it was, because there were just some moments where I felt like it lagged a little bit, like the pace was just a mm-hmm. little slow. But like, Julianne Long, it does, like, she just ropes me back in because her writing is so stunning. Like... I don't it's know how. It's so <laughs> great. And I just love it because the dynamic between Elise and LeVay, like they're both like got a quick wit and they mm-hmm. both have this really like temper. sarcastic sense of humor mm-hmm. and they do have a bit of a temper, yep. but they just know how to like egg the other one on. Mm-hmm. And so it's just, it's so great. And, you know, LeVay's like, challenging at least for the budget and he's like you can get livery if you can find where to f- make that happen in the budget and she's like all right challenge accepted <laughs> elise is very much a challenge accepted sort of character she's had a lot mm-hmm. of difficult things thrown at her and she just barrels through and makes things happen you know she's very positive and cheery and i i really love that about her and i think Something that I was thinking about is, you know, a lot of the time with the dynamic of the employer versus the employee, that can get a little bit, you know, nerve wracking or even the, you know, just differences in class, like the Lord mm-hmm. and the the peasant class person, because, yeah. you know, they can take advantage. Right. And so, like, I think like when when it's just like differences of class, you know, there's there's actually some freedom with the lower class person. Mm -hmm. Um, But when it's an employer employee situation, things can get real nerve wracking. Like it it can, because they have power over this person. And Mm -hmm. we've seen that in other books where I'm trying to think if there's another one where there's a governess 
well, there's a million with a governess, so I don't remember uh, which one. There's a million with the governess. But a governess the ward, who was the like, lord with the ward. Uh, I remember it. It was the Courtney Milan, the governess um, affair, I believe. Mm. Um, because the governess game is Tessa Dare, and I always confuse them, but it's the governess affair. And she was raped, right, by the Duke, yeah. who was her, her employer. But, you know, in this book, we have Elise who's pushing back very, like, strongly every time mm-hmm. she's like I want to give in I know what passion is but she knows the consequences of that passion you know exactly and I love the moment I included it because mm-hmm. just to like say that she pushes back against it but she's very vocal about that to live to the point where at one point she's like yeah you can talk like that but I can't like would you yeah. talk like that I'm a housekeeper not an equal and he's like you're right I'm sorry like and he instantly realizes that he's crossed a line. Yeah, he realizes he he keeps like hitting that line and going like fuck, I can't do this. I'm mm-hmm. being bad. And like it almost got scary, like not scary, but it almost didn't work for me and then Julia and Long like d- puts a brilliant paragraph of LeBay being like this is not right. I shouldn't do this. And then mm-hmm. And then the same when they finally do come together, when, she, when you know, Elise decides, no, this is something I want for me and I'm just going to look at this as like we're a man and a woman, you know, who yeah. have passion and I'm okay with that. I've gotten to a point of mm-hmm. that, that that's just where something that – Well, and exactly. And he kind of – he initiates it, but then he stops himself and he is like, I think you know what I want to happen, but – that's your decision to make. Like you can walk out of here with no repercussions and understand that I'm not going to hold it against you. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, so so there was just some moments where I was kind of like, I think as a reader, I was a little bit like, oh, what's going to happen? Or like, okay, guys, let's like move the story along. Mm-hmm. But those, so that's why I think I didn't maybe like love it as much as you, but I still thought it was really good and sweet. And I, I read somewhere that he is a little bit inspired by Captain Von Trapp from Sound of Music, which oh. I totally get now, just like this kind of like grumpy Captain <laughs> vibes. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that because I was like, because it wasn't quite a Beauty and the Beast tale, but like mm-hmm. it almost had like reminiscences of a Beauty and the Beast tale because like he was this surly, grumpy guy. And then they make this beautiful analogy where she's like reading her son a fairy tale, the fairy tale of the lion with a thorn in his paw. And then she like has this realization. She's like, oh, my God, he's in pain. He's not a mean human who's just in a temper all the time. He's in pain. Like he's just a lion with a thorn in his paw. And maybe I can help take the pain away way yes and i i really loved that storyline when she decides to bring him the willow bark tea and Mm -hmm. like and just she's like this is a huge risk like absolutely enormous i could lose my job over this or i could triumph and make his life better and she just went for it Exactly. And like at first he was offended and then he was like, no, but I am in pain actually. So if like you say it might work, I'll take it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, let's talk even more about our hero and heroine. What did you think about LaVey? Um, I thought LaVey was a really interesting character, especially since we had gotten to know him previously in Violet and Flint's book. Mm -hmm. And he was this charmer, you know, like he didn't really seem like he really he had cares, but he was a little bit less like caring Mm -hmm. of a person. And so it's just very interesting to see this whole other side of him where you get this the side of him that's really like missing home. And, you know, he was just striving so hard to regain all that his family has lost. And he doesn't like, you know, his mother, his father gone. He literally just has his grandfather and his sister and they both need him to help take care of them. And so he's just doing his best to like figure out the family. And then he's been attacked and he's recovering and he's not recovering fast enough for his liking. And so it's just really interesting to see this whole other side of him because all we really saw before was like the suave, flippant Frenchman. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yet, he's very layered of a hero, I would say. 
I agree. I think, and I think it's interesting to come into his story at a low point of his life, because like you said, he was such a suave, kind of flippant, carefree type, right? Mm-hmm. Um, just very French, you know, and, yeah. and he, he continues that throughout the book. But you come in at a low point of his life where he's mm-hmm. taken out of his element, he's in pain, and he's like on the cusp of opportunities, but doesn't know where to go. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's like a really interesting part of somebody's life. I think another reason why the story made me stressed a little bit, um, is that, you know, so his big conflict was how does he repair his life and get his estates back? Mm -hmm. And, you know, he talks you know, a lot about this, this home that he had in France and about needing to like make some, make a life and a name for Marie Helene and to kind of restore his family's fortune basically by Mm -hmm. connecting them back with their properties in France. And he has two ways of getting that one, marrying Alexandra and getting her dowry, um, or two, uh, working for the king, you know, one more mission, um, which will be extremely dangerous. Um, but we'll barely survive the last one, (laughs) but we'll pay very well. And, you know, in the end, he chooses to do neither to let go of his, uh, that, of that dream in favor of a new dream, which is Elise and being married. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was still like, I felt that loss. I felt the loss of him making that choice. And you included that beautiful paragraph at the end when he says like, there's life and there is death, but you know, without you. There is no difference between them. I mean, that's just yeah. so beautiful. I, and that was the thing is like Julianne Long's like every th- – all the phrasing that came out of him like when mm-hmm. it was like meaningful, like it was just oh, – it was so beautiful, like all of it. And th- in that moment, she – I was like, dang it, Julie. Like Julianne, like this – now I have to be like, okay with him letting go of his property because you said it so beautifully. Like you, you, you came, you brought this arc uh, to such a mm-hmm. perfect closure, but I'm still, I was still worried and sad. I was like the whole, the whole story. I was like, he, he's, I know he's not going to get that at the end. And I, yeah. and I am mourning that loss, even though it was it, that, that was like the moral of the story, right? Which is yes. that you can let go of the past and look to the future and, and build your home, mm-hmm. find your family. But I think too, I mean, he kind of made that decision, but then I really liked how he made the decision beforehand, but I also really appreciated how he, he his decision was reaffirmed, not just by Elise, but by his sister coming. Mm-hmm. And she was like, I can't believe you t- kept this from me, number mm-hmm. one. Like, I'm not a child anymore. And number two, like... Do I want our house back in Provence? Absolutely. But nothing's the same there. You know, like he was so he was so worried about her and trying to keep her in her life with Parisian society and trying to keep everything up. And she's like, honestly, like, I don't even know if I want to be there because it's not the same. And people look down upon us. And it's like, you know, even if we were to have that property, it's not going to be the same. So. You know, so it was just really nice to have his sister be there and really affirm the decision he'd already made. He was also really cute with Jack. Like, uh, you know, obviously oh gosh, he's going to be. But like, I really liked that the moment he met him, he was like, there is a lot I can impart upon this young boy. And oh, I have a lot to impart upon someone. And oh, I'd like to have kids, like to be able to impart all the things I've learned. And oh, I enjoy doing that. And like, yeah, that was so heartwarming. <laughs> I love it too because he and Elise, like from the beginning, like Elise and her interactions with her son, is she's always like telling him what words mean because mm-hmm. she says she's not going to dumb down her language just because he's a child. Like she's cur- he's curious and bright and he can learn what these words mean and she's mm-hmm. not going to talk down to him. And it was really great because instantly. LeVay was like, well, I don't believe in talking down to children. And so it just was like so cute because he continued on. And but that's what makes Jack so great is because he's like, what is that? He's still six, you know, so he refers to LeVay as are you the giant that lives here? And he's like, I guess so. Um, (laughs) But then it's a word. He's like, what does that mean? He's like, that word means this. He's like, "Okay, great. (laughs) So sweet. 
So, and of course, then, you know, the, the, the word learning what the word bastard meant is like the, the important part of the story. Like the themes that Julianne Long weaves. Ugh, so good. I Anyhow. know. So what would you rate Leve as a hero? I'd rate him a pretty solid nine. He's pretty great. I think he's pretty great too. I love the like grumpiness and the, you know, the sweetness with the boy and then the mm-hmm. kind of like suave sexiness with Elise. But like I said, he just didn't quite resonate with me. So I'll have to give him an eight. <laughs> oh, so sad. Um, but let's talk about Elise on let's the other hand. Elise. Elise is great. Um, I don't know a lot of other heroines like her. I feel like she's pretty unique. She is. She is unique in the sense that, like, she's had the trauma. She's been forced to, like, gain get new employment very quickly. And yet she's still very upbeat. Like, she's very positive and optimistic, but not in a naive way, which I think is so different. Is usually they're optimistic and unique, but it's like you're, they're optimistic and bright, but there's this some – kind of naivety that they have versus Elise doesn't have that. Like she's kind of like eyes wide open. She knows where her boundaries are. She knows what she does and does not need to do. And she also does not believe in failing. You know, she gets tasked with these servants and she's like, I'm sorry, I need this job. So screw all of you. You need to shape up. (laughs) I think my favorite part of Elise is her teacher like voice, quote unquote, you know, like when she's like, I have worked with young girls, you will be no match for me to the servants, basically. And just like, just is able to kind of talk them into doing what she wants by Mm -hmm. having them provide the answer, basically. Like, it's, it's so great. It's, it's really cute and clever. And yeah, I, that's, I think maybe my favorite part. Yes, well, and all they they try to pull little pranks on her, and like my favorite was, you know, they do like a whoopee cushion in her chair, and she's just like, "This is ridiculous." And she sees one of the footmen like trying to retain a laughter. She's like, "You can laugh; it's funny." <laughs> However, it's not going to deter me. Yeah, like, it's <laughs> you guys are going to have to do a lot better than that to like yeah. get me into a bad spot. <laughs> she's. She's really great because even though she like, you know, talks people into things at the end of the day, she doesn't treat them like children and she doesn't treat children like children either. And that gets respect and Mm -hmm. people, people want to do things for her by the end of it. And that's just brilliant. I don't know that I know another heroine that I'm like, that I, that I could compare like one-on-one to her where a lot of the time we do have heroes and heroines that are very similar. I just like, yes, there are other storylines that are similar. Yes, there are this, but I feel like she's going to be one that I remember very uniquely, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I liked her a lot. I thought she was... There was a lot to really admire about her as a character. Agreed. And I think that, yeah, she just was really fully warm. But again, like I said earlier, I really just didn't liked her interactions with LaVey because she did test the boundaries, but she was always there to like – to. she wasn't there to uplift herself. She never really like – she was always like, I am your housekeeper. I am doing my job the best of my abilities. You know, yes, we have a thing going on, but that doesn't mean that – we get to necessarily indulge in that. Yeah. Well, what would we rate Elise then? Nine and a half. I'm going to give her the same nine and a half. Super amazing. Great. I just yeah. love her. Loved her. Yeah. But speaking of Elise, because my favorite quote from the book is something that LaVey thinks pretty early on, and mm. it's just beautiful and I love it. So my one of my – I have two in there. Um, but this one is LaVey thinking about Elise after knowing her for a few days. And he says, Some trees toppled when continually battered by storms. Others just grew deeper, stronger roots. He suspected he knew what kind of tree Mrs. Fountain would be. Yep. So great. Oh, I love that he like gets a read on her right away. Yes. And then again, I talked about their flirtations and their double entendres and this and that. So Elise is in LaVey's office and she they were talking and then things kind of took a moment and she he's like, oh, what are you thinking? And she just says, the carpet, he'd been a little like flirtatious and a little 
upper handed male. And she's like, the carpets in this room need beating too, she said quite neutrally. And at that, he turned abruptly, plucked up the quill and twirled it in his fingers. She was almost positive he'd turned in order to hide a smile. Are you implying that something else in this room would benefit from a beating, Mrs. Fountain? He said idly, dragging the letter toward him. Oh, I love, I have a, I have a little like moment like that, that I have uh, also to read. It's when Mm -hmm. they first met um, and he's deciding if she can be his housekeeper. And he asks, you know, he's like, basically like, she's tongue tied for just a moment. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, he says something sarcastic. And then she says, forgive me, Lord LeVay. I do know how to sit. She tried a little half smile. She knew she possessed a portion of charm, though it was a trifle rusty from disuse, given that she'd locked it away after it had gotten her into trouble. And then he says, if you would be so kind as to demonstrate your ability to do so. <laughs> like, <laughs> just this, like, exchange about her sitting down. I yeah. freaking love. Now, I have another, like, big portion that we didn't talk about. Um, that I it, It's going to be a bit of a long quote, but I really love this. Okay, um, go for and it. And it's, it's this moment where, you know, he, he has asked her to help him waltz. And the moment that he asks her to, like practice waltzing with him we all know the song that's what happen. i said something yeah. was about to happen they're waltzing in a study let's be real but it's a beautiful passage so he it says and then he eased them into a waltz and he begins to count out loud one two three one two three one two three one two three one two was a murmur and then he forgot to count because the silence itself sang. The soft, soft sound of their breathing, the rhythm of her breath as it lifted her rib cage beneath his hand, their feet sinking into the freshly beaten carpet, were enough music. The flush in her cheeks, the heat in his own. She was so light that he felt as though he'd grown wings during his convalescence rather than scars. He certainly couldn't recall ever feeling so weightless. You've gone mad, you've gone mad, you've gone mad, you've gone mad was the refrain in Elise's head repeated in Walt's time signature. It's like, oh my gosh. Uh, and then I later, know. as like the scene develops, mm-hmm. she starts thinking in her head, housekeeper, housekeeper, yeah, housekeeper, housekeeper, housekeeper. And like that, like the music with, you know, the, I yeah. love what Julianne's done there. I mean, uh, first of all, the silence itself sang and then that, that paragraph itself, but Oh, just what a beautiful, beautiful image. Oh, I know. Oh, but that was the thing is like, those are one of those moments, like that was one of those moments where I just was like, <gasps> like, you know, there were so many great little lines. Like, and the thing is like, for me, like when I said I felt teary eyed, like one of my teary eyed moments was like that I put it in there, you know, the conversation that LaVey has with Jack about what being a bastard is. I just like, Mm -hmm. I could imagine them sitting in that bell tower and the six-year-old boy just being so defeated and LaVey is just there not trying to say, oh, the world's mean and don't listen to mean people. He's like, you're going to have to deal with this, but you're going to deal with it with grace and strength because that's who you are. And I'm just like, oh, how sweet. (laughs) It is... It is, again, just there's a lot of beauty and sweetness and like symbolism that Julianne Long is so good at. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's really wonderful. And like in that moment after, you know, Philippe and uh, Elise are together for the first time, she has just this quick line that says they had stolen time. They had not stopped it. And it's mm-hmm. like, you know, like that really solidifies Elise kind of, you know, the understanding as a reader that like Elise has made this decision. It's just like, there's so many little moments in this book Mm -hmm. that are really beautifully done. Anyhow, speaking of their encounter, we have our steaminess rating and our encounter counter. Yes. We had a good encounter counter. It was up to five. So that's Mm -hmm. pretty good. Yeah, it was. And I would say it was pretty steamy. I would say that too. I mean, three, four and five were like, whew. Yeah. So I would say this was like a pipe in hot cup of tea you're ready to drink. Absolutely. And how feminist do you feel we were? I think this book was such a supporter because Elise was, you know, 
Elise was fabulous. We've already talked about it. She was outspoken. She stood up for herself. She educated her ch- her child well. You know, mm-hmm. she provided for her child. Um, LaVey was, you know, similar in a lot of his ways. He was very supportive of, of you know, the people underneath and around him. I think that came from being a soldier and yes. trying times. And uh, But I think also, too, his ability to... Um, believe in Elise and like, you know, keep going. But then at the same time too, even when he found out, he didn't condemn her. He didn't Mm -mm. be like, oh, you kept this a secret. Like from the moment he finds out she has a son and then he finds out the circumstances of her son's paternity, he's just like, that's not your fault. Like the shame Mm -mm. is his, not the other way around. Like, yeah, so. for sure. Yeah, I thought this was great. But I also just think like everything we talked about with Elise's character of how, you know, she brings others up around her, you know, and kind of get, brings out the best in people. Like, mm-hmm. I think that that to me is the kind of person that I want a younger, impressionable person reading about so that they feel inspired to be more like that themselves. Absolutely. All right. So our final book rating, what would you give this book? I would give this book an eight. I'm going to give it a nine. I'm not surprised. I think we I were like really right loved there. it. I just like really, I think what it was is it was like for me, it just was exactly what I needed to read right then. It wasn't because it wasn't traumatic. It wasn't heavy. It was just like a perfect, like, you know, instant connection, but just like grows over time. And yet there wasn't this will they, won't they, you know, aspect of it. It was like everyone was there with their eyes wide open. And I just really appreciated that. Yes, that is true. And before we wrap up, though, I wanted to talk about the fact that we were like, why was this book book 10, you know, before book 11, there was oh. like one little piece, right, of of information to Lion and Olivia's story, which is that, you know, Lion had to find out that Olivia is getting married. Now, I love this book, but I still hold by my story that like, are you kidding me? One more book, another year of waiting. Like, that was so mean. <laughs> well, and then especially to like have the little pieces of like LaVey and Lion Redmond saved him and how he was going to repay him. And then he repays him with like the last line. And it, the book literally ends with the line. She's getting married the second Saturday in May. Yeah. And you're just like, oh. And then I was like, where's the epilogue? Where's the epilogue? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Was there no epilogue? It was just no chapter epilogue. one of the next book. Oh. It it wasn't yeah, no, it wasn't even that because it just like cuts they basically get married. Like the epilogue was essentially the last chapter, which mm-hmm. is it cuts to them getting married and then he sends dashes off a note and he sends one of his liveried footmen to l- deliver this note to the ship. Oh yeah. You know, where really he knows great. Lion Redmond would be and you know, he sees that note and then the next book will, you know, start where that one starts. But we don't really know anything more than that he has been alerted. Oh, my gosh. Well, speaking of that, we are not reading The Legend of Lion Redman next time. No, we're not, because we're going to be really mean and we're going to make you wait for it, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the good news is we're going to be reading it soon. Very soon. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we're going to be completing we're our Penny Royal done. journey. We have started the journey from our first episode, Zoe. I know. And we're just now coming to an end. And with that, I do have an ask for you guys. We'd love to hear what things you guys would like to know from us. Like if you have questions about our opinions of things or overarching Penny Royal questions, we'd love to Mm -hmm. hear those and we would love to answer them on an upcoming show. Mm -hmm. So I've got a handy link for you. It's bit.ly slash ask a strumpet. And there's going to be a question form for you guys. You can just... Give us your name and your question. And it doesn't have to be exactly Penny Royal related. If you if there's something you guys want to know about us or about the show or anything like that, that's a perfect place for it. And we will answer those questions in an upcoming episode. Yes. You can also send us an email at romancepod at gmail.com because this is our long series and we did Bridgerton long series 
but we have not started another long series, Zoe. We haven't. I have two different series, one that's long and one that's short in mind that we'll have to talk about. But listeners, what would you like us to do next? Well, that's what I'm saying. Uh, Send us an email and let us know what either long series or it can be a short series too. What complete series you would like us to cover? Yes, because I think it's really fun to do mid-series books and, you know, that way you get a little flavor of here and there. But I Mm -hmm. love having like our overarching kind of what we're doing series. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we'd love to hear from you guys. Again, bit.ly slash askastrumpet or our email romancepod at gmail.com. But we haven't told you what we're reading next week. And next week, we're going to be going to a much requested, back to a much requested uh, series, which is we're finishing up our Bridgerton Happily Ever Afters, and we're going to Colin and Penelope's story. Yes. So join us next time as we talk all about the second epilogue for Romancing Mr. Bridgerton. Yes, I can't wait. So join us all next time. And may all your ever afters end happily. Tea and Strumpets is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts.